This is a very familiar carol, but you may not know that there are over 400 versions of it, including at least one that the Victorians had to clean up because it was too rude. There's a theory that this well-loved carol has in fact a secret message, an 18th century call to rebellion. You see, although to us the image of singers performing traditional carols is a safe and reassuring one, that's not always been the case. The true history of the carol is far less cosy and sentimental than you'd imagine. I'm going on a journey from ancient pagan ritual to present day pub singing to show that for the poor old carol, Christmas was rarely a season of goodwill and comfort and joy were often hard to find. Carols have been attacked by the church. They prohibited people engaging in carols. They've been outlawed by the state. This is a Puritan revolution. They really feared the fact that Christmas was an origins of pagan festival. Carols have been used as a cover for subversion. Yes, this is the 18th century Da Vinci Code. Born the king of not the angels, but the king of the English. Carol singers have been victims of snobbery. It didn't sound quite like the Cambridge or Oxford College choir, which they had been accustomed. But in the end, the carol has triumphed to become an integral part of every Christmas. The service of nine lessons and carols originated here. Britain's first ever proper carol service. Carols have survived because ordinary people have kept them alive. So there'll be performances from pub carolers and musical waiters, folk singers and village bands. So does she dress up like this at home? <laughs> as well as traditional musicians and cathedral choirs. I'm going to find out the true, surprising and often secret history of the Christmas carol. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. When you're standing right underneath them, these stones really are quite awe-inspiring. A 12th century historian said that when they finished Stonehenge, when the last stone was raised, the event was marked with a celebration by Christian abbots and bishops. He was, of course, spectacularly wrong. These stones are most definitely pagan. In fact, they'd been up for 2,000 years when Jesus was born. So what's all this got to do with Christmas carols, I hear you ask? Well, apart from the fact that an ancient nickname for Stonehenge was the giant's carol, carol meaning dance, I'm here because of the reason that Stonehenge was built in the first place. There's a theory that our midwinter celebrations began in places like this. We've had a thousand years of wild guesses as to why this fabulous structure was raised. But one thing is agreed, Stonehenge is specifically aligned to follow the movement of the sun. Every summer solstice, hundreds gather here to see the sun rise between these stones. But archaeologists believe that to understand the true meaning of Stonehenge, they should, in fact, be facing the other way. You see, all the important stones are at the opposite end of the structure. This is the largest and probably the first to be raised, and lying here is its twin, which fell over many centuries ago. And they were set in place so that on the winter solstice, December the 21st, the sun set directly between the two of them, marking the end of the cold, short days and the start of a welcome new year with its promise of longer, brighter days. Someday soon we all will be together if the fates allow. Who knows exactly what the chilly Neolithic henge folk did to mark midwinter? It's hard to believe there wasn't some kind of singing and dancing to see off the shortest day. But at the most basic level, when the nights are long, you need a celebration to keep your spirits up. Until then, when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity in the 4th century, their pagan midwinter celebrations were replaced by celebrations of the birth of Christ. It was a PR success. 
the people of the empire could party just as before. But this decision would leave a problem for successive generations. Had Christmas truly left its pagan past behind, and how should the nativity be celebrated? With carols and dancing, or was that the devil's work? The centuries to come would be rough on the poor carol. For the first 600 years of church history, the only music that you'd hear was plain song. Plain song is a monophonic chant, which means that it's a single unaccompanied vocal line, usually sung by a priest, nun or monk. The Catholic Church was very strict as to what could be sung and what couldn't, and there was no place for anything as tuneful as a carol. Plain song is at its most resonant and powerful when it's allowed to reverberate around a vast space, like this building, the Great Court at the heart of the British Museum. It's as if this most ancient of singing techniques actually needs the stone and the marble to create maximum spiritual impact. Now, plain song is reflective, calm, meditative, often very beautiful, but it doesn't really do joy and fun. And if you were a medieval peasant and you're expected to be in church every five minutes, this was the only music on offer all year round. Meanwhile, outside of church, people were marking saints' days and festivals like Christmas with singing and dancing. But the church was very suspicious of such celebrations. Paula Gooder has studied this period. Paula, why did the medieval church have such a problem with carols? Well, you've got to bear in mind that it's not just carols as we would understand them, not Christmas carols, but carols in the medieval period was associated with dancing. And this was a religion that was suspicious because the dancing is associated with the pre-Christian pagan institutions. So if the church disapproved of people being too revelrous, uh, what did they do to stop them doing that then? Well, there was a series of councils which began in the 6th century and stretched as far as the 13th century, in which they prohibited people engaging in carols. To begin with, that just meant singing and dancing in church. Later on, it meant singing at all. But the days of plain song were numbered. The Catholic Church couldn't keep carols outlawed forever. And surprisingly, it was someone within the church itself who helped bring about a musical revolution. The Germans may have given us the Christmas tree and the Americans the turkey, but it's the Italians we have to thank for Christmas carols, in particular St Francis of Assisi. He felt that too much emphasis had been placed on the cross of Jesus and not enough on the crib. He wanted to excite people with incarnation, the idea of God becoming man. And one way of doing this was to whip up enthusiasm for Christmas and have lots of jolly songs to sing to celebrate the birth of Christ. So St Francis and his followers took the popular folk dances of the day and gave them sacred words. Not surprisingly, these soon became popular all over Europe. Angelus ad virginem subim in conclave Virginis formidinem de mulcens in quit ave, ave regina virginum, celi tereque dominum, concipies et paries intacta, salutem hominum, tu porta celi pacta, medella criminum. Angelus ad virginem sub in transim conclave, Virginis formidinem de mulcens in quit ave. Buon Natale! Grazie! It was probably the Christmas-loving Franciscans who, 700 years ago, first brought the carol to the British Isles. These new festive songs arrived with church approval. But this wasn't to last. In the meantime, carols were so well received by an enthusiastic population that by the 16th century, they were an established part of the Christmas celebrations. 
The people of Tudor England loved Christmas and their monarchs shared their enthusiasm. If Christmas had been a woman, Henry VIII would have married it. When evergreens were put up as decorations on Christmas Eve, it was the queue for 12 days of feasting and merrymaking at court and around the country. And there was plenty of singing too. The Tudors took the joy unleashed by the Italian carols and took it a stage further, ushering in the heyday of the English carol. So in the courts of Henry VII and Henry VIII, the music they laid on at Christmas reflected a popular interest in songs about the nativity. Ballad songs and part songs for small amateur choirs began popping up. And these songs, some of them still survive today, like Adam Lay Bounden or the Cherry Tree Carol. But it wasn't just in court that people wanted to sing these songs. Outside the court, ordinary people had folk carols. Indeed, quite a few of these folk carols look suspiciously like they started out life as ordinary songs about other things altogether, and at some point they got adapted to the Christmas story. One such example of this might be the song Tomorrow Shall Be My Dancing Day. When you sing the basic first verse of this, it sounds just like a song about two young lovers going to a dance. Tomorrow shall be my dancing day, I would my true love did so chance To see the legend of my play, to call my true love to the dance. But at some point, this song got attached to the story of Christ's life, especially the nativity part at the beginning, and that's the part that stuck. So what we sing today is an old amalgamation of these two versions, secular and sacred. So the second verse, for example, goes like this. In a manger laid and wrapped I was, so very poor this was my chance, betwixt an ox and a silly poor ass, to call my true love to my dance. Now, a key development in the life of the carol was the arrival of the mystery play, which was a dramatic and often lavish retelling of Bible stories acted out by ordinary people in the streets where they lived. Because of this, people got used to the idea of telling Bible stories in a vivid and imaginative way, whether it be the shepherds in the fields, or the wise men coming to the manger, or Mary and Joseph on their donkey. Some of the carols that were sung at these mystery plays still survive today. The best known example is probably the Coventry Carol. It's a song about the massacre of the innocents, when Herod ordered his men to go and kill all the firstborn of Bethlehem. It's sung by the mothers trying to put their children to sleep, lest their crying alerts the soldiers.
Although the Tudor era was a high point for the carol in England, there were indications of trouble ahead, and they've got something to do with this bird. This is a classic Tudor dish. It's a chicken stuffed with a pheasant, stuffed with a partridge, stuffed with three quails. Not for the faint-hearted. And in one sense, you can understand the need of people to have such an over-the-top dish, since for many of them, the Christmas Day feast was the first proper meal they'd had in four weeks of moderation during Advent. But with the rise of a stricter Puritan form of Christianity in the 1550s, there were an increasing number of people who were distressed at the way their countrymen were eating and singing their way through Christmas. And within a generation, they would be able to do something about it. Now, if you know anything about the history of Christmas, you probably think that that man, Oliver Cromwell, had it cancelled, which isn't strictly speaking true, because although he supported the ban, it became law before he came to power. The men behind the ban were a group of devoutly religious parliamentarians who believed that churches should be stripped of their ornaments, their statues, their organs, and in Westminster Abbey, they had the stained glass windows removed. So any chance of jolly old Christmas carols surviving a regime like that was surely very thin. Thank you. This is the handwritten journal of the House of Lords for the 8th of June 1647. It's a written account of everything that happened in Parliament that day. And it says here, for as much as the feasts of the Nativity of Christ Easter and Whitsuntide and other festivals commonly called Holy Days have been heretofore superstitiously used and observed, be it ordained by the Lords and Commons in Parliament assembled that the said Feasts of the Nativity of Christ, Easter and Whitsuntide and all other festival days commonly called Holy Days be no longer observed as festivals or Holy Days within this Kingdom of England and Dominion of Wales. Seems extraordinary to us that Christmas and Easter should be viewed in such a way, and that something that seems so harmless to us, like the singing of a carol or the use of holly and ivy as decorations, should have aroused such strong feelings of antipathy, passions that led Parliament itself to issue a law about it. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing... In the shadow of Westminster Abbey, I met up with Professor Ronald Hutton at St Margaret's Church, to find out just what it was about Christmas that the Puritans so feared. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. They really feared the fact that Christmas was in origins a pagan festival, which is true. There's nothing in the Bible to say at what time of year Christ was born, and there's nothing in the Bible to say that you should celebrate the Nativity religiously. What's more, it had been celebrated religiously by the Roman Catholic Church all through the Middle Ages. And also, this is a Puritan revolution. It's not business as usual. It's a regime which has come through the bloodiest and worst civil war in our entire history and is there to remake England, Wales and Cornwall in preparation for the second coming of Christ. And to tolerate the wrong belief is literally soul-destroying. It's destroying your chances of salvation and those of uh, the people who depend on you. Did priests and churches ever actually openly defy the ban? Oh, you bet. Here, for example, at St Margaret's Westminster. St Margaret's is right outside the doorway of the House of Commons, and in blatant defiance of the ban upon Christmas, the people who controlled St Margaret's put up holly and ivy in the church decorated for Christmas, not just having prayers, not just having a service, but actually blazoning Christmas all over the interior of the church to the fury of the MPs who had the uh, church wardens here arrested. Puritans believed that songs composed by man should never be sung in church. Only the Old Testament psalms, which they thought were divinely inspired, were allowed. The Bible was at the heart of the church, not decoration or ritual. It was a place to hear scripture read and preached. What they really loathed and feared were things that took people's minds away from the Bible and from the sermon, like music that would engage the senses and stop people listening to the word. 
Puritans believed that psalms should be chanted in what they thought was the old-fashioned Israelite way. It's Catholics who like music in churches. That's why Puritans hate organs in churches, as well as what we'd now regard as hymns. So it seems that the Puritans did tolerate Christmas carols just as long as they weren't sung in church. And surprisingly, even the most famous Puritan of all was fond of the occasional sing-along. Take Oliver Cromwell, who's stereotypical Puritan warrior. Cromwell loved dancing, music, and really silly party games in his private life. But to have those things brought anywhere near worship was to Cromwell literally damnable. To show their displeasure at the banning of Christmas, the Puritans' opponents set their protest to music. Listen to me and you shall hear news hath not been this thousand year Since Herod, Caesar and many more You never heard the like before Holy days are despised, new fashions devised Old Christmas is kicked out of town Yet let's be content, the times lament You see the world's turned on upside down To conclude I'll tell you news that's right Christmas was killed at Naseby fight Charity was slain at the same time Jack tell truth to a friend of mine Likewise then did die roast beef and shred pie Hey goose and cape on the water found But let's be content the times are meant To see the world turned upside down It must have felt in the 1640s that the world had been turned upside down, yet Christmas survived the Puritan era. Talking to Ronald Hutton, it's clear that Christmas survived not only because the ban was unpopular, but because Cromwell and co allowed it to survive, tolerating carols just as long as they were sung at home. I've come to see the Puritan dislike of Christmas as having a certain integrity to it. They didn't want the celebrations of the birth of Christ to distract from the faith of Christ, concerns still expressed today. It's ironic that carols about a child born into poverty can become the mere background music to a season of spending. This carol, O Come All Ye Faithful, regularly tops the polls of our favourite Christmas carols. For the last hundred years, it's been at the heart of every hymn book, and no carol service is complete without it. And yet, it's claimed that this most traditional of Christmas songs has its own secret, subversive past. Although by the 18th century, carols still weren't sung in churches, they were still being written and sometimes in unusual circumstances. If you were a Catholic in 18th century Britain, life wasn't much fun. Although the Puritan era had ended, you still couldn't be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer. If you had land, you had to pay twice as much tax as your Protestant neighbours, and for some reason, you couldn't own a horse worth more than five pounds. One of the few places that you could worship in safety were the chapels attached to the London embassies of Catholic countries, like this one. In a place like this, they couldn't touch you. Although now it's a parish church in Soho, this used to be the chapel of the Portuguese embassy. Beleaguered English Catholics could come here for mass because the building was protected by international law. One man who worshipped here in the early 18th century was John Francis Wade, thought to be the author of O Come All Ye Faithful. What 
what we sing today is an English translation of the Latin hymn Wade called Adeste Fidelis, Draw Near Ye Faithful Ones. And well into the 19th century it was known as the Portuguese hymn because it was here that it was first made popular. Like all the best Christmas songs and hymns, it has a great shape. It starts like a normal hymn. And then in the middle it has this repetition, this refrain, O come let us adore him, O come let us adore him, O come let us adore him, with the climax on Christ the Lord. And it's this repetition that makes it so memorable and catchy. But there is an intriguing theory that this very popular carol isn't quite what it seems. I met up with Professor Bennett Zong, who studied the history of Adeste Fidelis. So Bennett, who was John Francis Wade? He was a scribe who worked in the embassy chapels in London. He worked um, on manuscripts such as these. He was also a publisher. He published books right through the uh, 1770s. Um, and he often adorned them with exquisite um, drawings, flowers and ornaments um, that, of the kind that you'd see in a medieval manuscript. But Roman Catholicism at this time was illegal, and Wade provided um, what is essentially an underground press to that community who simply refused um, to follow the, uh, the, the Church of England. The claim that John Francis Wade is the author of Adeste Fidelis is based on the fact that it's in Wade's manuscripts that the carol first appears. But for Bennett, the authorship of the carol isn't as important as the message contained within it. Wade was a Jacobite, someone who believed that the Stuart kings should reclaim the British throne. Many Catholics supported the Jacobite cause as they hoped that Charles Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, would return and abolish the laws that made their lives so difficult. Bennett believes that throughout the books published by Wade, there are secret messages of encouragement for his Jacobite readers. Yes, this is the 18th century Da Vinci Code. Um, what you have here on the front of the book on its title page is a Jacobite conundrum. And it's very difficult um, to interpret. You have to read from the top down into the middle all the way to the end of the line and then from the bottom up into the middle to the end of the line. So it reads, quos anguis tristi diro cum vulnere stravit, and then up, hos sanguis Christi miro tum munere lavit. Where is Tom Hanks when you need him? <laughs> to read a code. Well, the code means those who suffer with a sad, dread wound are with the blood of Christ washed afterward. Well, Christ is Bonnie Prince Charlie. The wonderful gift is the restoration of the Stuart monarchy and the return of Catholicism to its um, rightful place on the throne of England. So there's the, references to Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Jacobite cause. Is there any in Adeste Fidelis itself? Well, Adeste Fidelis, it wouldn't seem to have that kind of imagery, but if you look closer, you do see it. Adeste Fidelis, come all ye faithful. Now, who are the faithful? The faithful are the Jacobites. Come to Bethlehem, triumphant. Bethlehem is England. Born is the Regem Angelorum, the king of not the angels, but instead a pun, Regem Anglorum, the king of the English. So this text, without any shadow of a doubt, has built within it um, Jacobite resonances and Jacobite images. It's an audacious theory, but what is definitely true and remarkable is that by the middle of the 19th century, Adeste Fidelis, or O Come All Ye Faithful, is as popular in Protestant churches as Catholic ones. So how did it come out of this secret hidden world and become suddenly something everybody embraced? The London Embassy Chapels, the Roman Catholic London Embassy Chapels, were very popular amongst Protestants as much as amongst Catholics. And that was because the quality of musical performance at the Embassy Chapels was incredibly high. Mm. And so Protestants arguably treated it to some extent as a, as a concert. And would Wade have minded that it became popular in the Protestant church that he so despised? <laughs> I think Wade was a... a, a totally unreconstructed Catholic. Uh, I think Wade would have felt very bad about it having finally been embraced by the Anglican Church. That having been said, I think he would have liked the idea that um, Adeste Fidelis is just so popular. Um, it's sung today by all Christian denominations. O Come All Ye Faithful is now featured in every collection of carols, of which there are many. These books give our carols an air of permanence, of solidity. 
But the British tradition of carol singing isn't like that at all. Down the centuries, our carols have survived partly because they've been able to change and evolve, with every region of Britain sporting its own variations. A good example of a carol that's existed in many different regional variations across the country is the only carol actually mentioned by name in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Now, this may have originated as long ago as the 16th century, where night watchmen and lamplighters were said to have sung it to this tune called Chestnut. But in fact, it's existed in lots of different versions. Listen to this one from the 18th century. It's very jaunty. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For Jesus Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. You see, back in those days, there was much more of a mix and match attitude to songs. You didn't have a perfect version where the words and the music had to fit together. You could take some words and add your local tune to it if you preferred. Here's one that was found in East Anglia, and it's like a folk tune. And notice how the mood has changed. Even though it's about comfort and joy, in fact, this sounds quite melancholy. God bless you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. To save poor souls from Satan's power that long had gone astray, which brings tidings of comfort and joy, joy and joy, which brings tidings of comfort and joy. The reason we still have our rich regional variety of carols is thanks to a band of enterprising gentlemen who during the 19th century went round collecting them. They'd travel the country encouraging villagers, who were no doubt rather bemused, to sing to them and then they wrote down the carols they heard. Or they copied out the books of carols that belonged to the rural communities. I'm on my way to Dorset to see one of these carol books and this one is rather special as it belonged to a famous family. This is a music book belonging to Thomas Hardy's grandfather, also called Thomas Hardy. He was a cello player in a local band, and he also went and played in the church. These musicians and singers would liven up the often dull psalms and hymns in the country services. If you look at the front page, it says Thomas Hardy, his book, April the 25th, 1800 and it's really made up of his own cello parts and the words of the songs he accompanied. And when you open it, what you get is a whole series of drinking songs and dances that would be performed in the local taverns and inns. This one's pretty representative. The miser may be pleased with gold, the sporting bow with pretty lass, but I'm best pleased when I behold the nectar sparkling in a glass. But here's the fascinating thing. If you turn it round and open the same book of drinking songs from the other end, what you have are 30 or so Christmas carols that they performed in church, including two versions, at least, of While Shepherds Watched Their Flocks by Night. This one here, in fact, is As Shepherds Watched Their Breeding Flocks in Open Fields by Night. You can see why the Victorians wanted to get rid of those breeding flocks. And this happy compromise, whereby the musicians would one day be playing in a tavern, playing drinking songs, and the next in the church doing Christmas carols, well, this compromise couldn't last forever. At first, the clergy and the village bands worked well together. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. This is the parish church of Puddletown, a village near Dorchester. And it's in the West Gallery of churches like this that these village choirs and their musicians performed. Indeed, Thomas Hardy's father and his grandfather both performed here in that gallery. And they were specifically built not just for acoustic reasons, but also if they had the musicians at the back of the church, then the congregation wouldn't be distracted from concentrating on the curate or vicar at the front of the church. The music that was played and sung in the galleries is still being kept alive today. This is the Purbeck Village Choir, an enthusiastic bunch of amateur musicians passionate about what's known as West Gallery music. 
morning. Good morning. Oh, no, good, good morning. Is it nippy out there? Yeah. It is very nippy out there. Oh dear, well get some singing to get warmed up. Two, 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 two fiddles. Two fiddles and viola. Yes. Yes. Well you better go up and get tuned up, get your resin on. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. And you're Chris, the conductor. Yes. Are they in good voice? Oh, I'm very much hoping so. So does yes. she dress up like this at home? <laughs> no, that's a fantastic beard. It is real, isn't it? It is indeed, sir. Yes, and it's a very hardy-ish beard, yes, I feel. Yes, that's right. And have you been singing in this choir for a very long time? It'll be 20 years next year. That's goodness. That's the same number of years I've been alive. Really? <laughs> oh. Uh, good morning. We've got another musician here. And you're going to be playing and singing or just playing? Just playing. Mm. And are you a husband and wife? Oh, no, no, no. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A legacy of the Puritan distaste for songs that weren't divinely inspired was the Church of England's ruling that only while shepherds watched their flocks by night could be sung at Christmas. It was allowed because it was so closely based on the Gospel of Luke. But the one carol rule was often ignored by the country churches. This carol, Awake and Join the Cheerful Choir, was part of the Puddletown Band's own repertoire and was performed both in church and in the surrounding villages on Christmas Eve. We have much to thank the West Gallery bands for. They kept alive our tradition of carol singing that had been in danger of dying out in the early 19th century. And they were an enterprising bunch. One crafty Cornish band managed to persuade a Scrooge-like church warden to give them extra money to buy strings for the bassoon. But the West Gallery bands were living on borrowed time. Musicians equally at home in the pub and the church, like Thomas Hardy's grandfather, were not acceptable to a new brand of Victorian vicar, who wanted control over church music and preferred the village choir to be more like a mini cathedral choir, robed and obedient. So you had these more serious clergymen who came along and found the singing that was going on a bit rowdy. It didn't sound quite like the Cambridge or Oxford College choir, which they had been accustomed to. It was not decorous. The independence of the singers and the band was a source of great offence to them. It didn't conform to their ideas of what a church worship should be. So wherever they could, they pulled the galleries down. They got rid of the bands. They moved the choir up to the chancel to keep an eye on them. And we usually reckon that's the end of the West Gallery movement. The carols lasted rather longer because they were mainly sung going around the village in the street and therefore the vicar didn't have quite the same control. Thomas Hardy wrote a bittersweet short story about the village choir of Long Puddle, surely modelled on this church. It's the Sunday after Christmas and the musicians in the gallery are tired and tipsy and they doze off during the sermon. Suddenly, they're awoken by the parson announcing the next hymn. Bewildered, they launch straight into the dancing jig they'd played in the party the night before. The parson and the squire are so outraged that they go and buy a barrel organ to play the music in church and hire a sober man to work it. And so, Hardy ruefully writes, the old players played no more. When the gallery choirs were disbanded, many of the musicians simply crossed the road to the Baptist and Methodist churches. Others played on in the pubs. Something special had indeed ended. But meanwhile, something special was beginning that would usher in a new age for the Christmas carol. It was the start of an exciting era in church music, a revolution that brought carols in from the cold and saw the creation of many of our favourites. There was a religious revival in the 19th century, of which the new type of vicar was a part, which gave a greater sense of urgency to British church life. It was felt that no opportunity should be missed for teaching and sharing the gospel, and that included hymns and carols 
even Scotland, suspicious of hymn singing since the Puritan era, saw some Protestant churches form their own choirs. Baptists and Methodists had been producing their own hymn books very successfully in the 1850s, and the Church of England soon followed suit. Thanks to books like Hymns Ancient and Modern, the whole country was literally singing from the same hymn sheet. And there was one other significant change in the history of carols. For the first time, they were being written by women. And strange though it may seem, that's the reason I'm standing in the office of one of the most powerful politicians in the country, a Secretary of State, no less. His diary for today reads, 8 a.m., very, very important meeting, 10 a.m., interview about the carol once in Royal David City. Douglas Alexander is Secretary of State for International Development, but he is also the great nephew of one of the most successful hymn writers of the Victorian era, Cecil Francis Alexander. I think in many ways my great aunt was a pioneer. Uh, she was a woman of independent means and independent fame at a time when that was frankly unusual, given the barriers that were in uh, the way of women. She married late. She married when she was 32. Uh, she was deeply committed to her Christianity and had a strong social conscience. Uh, I think she was probably quite a formidable woman as well as a compassionate woman. And in that sense, she was keen to instill a sense of obedience, a sense of duty, a sense of obligation on young children. And that's also reflected in some of her most famous hymns. Once in Royal David City first appeared in Cecil Alexander's book, Hymns for Little Children. She wrote it after hearing her godchildren complaining of the dreariness of church services. Each hymn was designed to explain a line from the creed. It produced classics such as All Things Bright and Beautiful and There is a Green Hill Far Away. Once in Royal was written to explain the line, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary. Her inspiration for those hymns was to teach children. She was very much a teacher for her times. She wanted to communicate with a simplicity and a clarity the essential doctrine of Christianity. Why do you think this Victorian carol, A Once in Royal David City, is, is so popular now? I mean, it's one of the most popular carols there is. I think for many of us, hearing Once in Royal David City sung at the beginning of Nine Lessons in Carols, on Christmas Eve has come to mark the real true beginning of Christmas. Uh, the haunting elegiac quality of the words allied to the sheer beauty of the melody uh, I think combines to explain why it's proved to be so popular for so long. I think it's very much become a part of Christmases for people literally right around the world. Did you ever sing that solo as a boy at the beginning of the carol? Uh, no, I can promise you that I never uh, visited the horror of solo singing on any congregation. But my childhood memory is of, on Christmas Eve, being in the kitchen in the manse in which I grew up with my mother preparing the uh, festivities and meal for the following day, my father preparing his sermon for the watch night service and hearing nine lessons and carols from Cambridge. The popularity of writers like Cecil Francis Alexander showed that carols had at last become respectable. But there was an event, one 24th of December, that truly put an end to fears of paganism and of the disapproval of bringing Christmas celebrations into church. To find out more, I have to head to Truro in the far southwest of England. This is the Cornwall Youth Choir and they're about to do something that hasn't been seen here for over 120 years. They're leaving the comfort of Truro Cathedral and heading out into the streets to bring some Christmas cheer to the shoppers. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay A choir used to sing carols at different locations around the city every Christmas Eve in Truro. It probably had its roots in wassailing, where people used to go from house to house offering a good luck drink and singing an appropriate carol. Give the patience stand by me if the most is telling Yonder peasant who is he, where and what is dwelling So he lives a good repentance underneath the mountain Right against the forest
In 1879, the Truro Choir ended their tradition of singing carols in the streets on Christmas Eve. Things were changing. This new cathedral was being built and they had their first bishop. Here he is, E.W. Benson, and he was a man with lots of ideas. Benson wanted to try something new for Christmas and he decided that there should be a service on Christmas Eve. The cathedral wasn't finished, and so it would be held in a large shed built as a temporary replacement. The service would start at 10pm to get men out of the pubs early so they wouldn't be drunk for the later midnight communion. And a brand new service was devised with nine lessons from the Bible and nine carols led by the choir. This is the order of service from that very Christmas Eve 128 years ago, Britain's first ever proper carol service. It's a template that's been adopted enthusiastically all over the world ever since, and most notably at King's College, Cambridge. And although they often get the credit for it, the service of nine lessons and carols originated here in Truro. And there were, in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The new service was more than just an excuse to sing carols. Benson wanted to show that the nativity is part of the wider story of man's redemption. So the service had nine readings progressing through the Bible from Adam's fall in Genesis to the promise of eternal life in the epistle of John. In a nice theatrical touch, the readers chosen represented the cathedral hierarchy, beginning with the choristers and ending with Bishop Benson himself. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The service that Christmas Eve was a huge success. The local paper noted that even Baptists and Methodists joined the congregation to enjoy the Christmas carols.
After Bishop Benson's innovations in Truro, carols truly became part of the mainstream. From then on, you could more or less hear them anywhere. I'm almost at the end of my journey. I'm in Yorkshire, heading to a rather special gathering that shows that although carols have been embraced by the establishment, they haven't become too safe and saccharine, and that the spirit of the rowdy village choir lives on. This is the Blue Ball pub in Worrell on the outskirts of Sheffield. Now, in most pubs, live music means karaoke or a dodgy Oasis tribute act. But here, live music in the weeks leading up to Christmas means something rather different. This enthusiastic crowd are a mixture of locals and visitors from all over the country who are continuing a 150-year-old tradition of singing Christmas carols in pubs. In late November and through December, they meet for two hours on Sunday lunchtimes in the small public bar, giving fresh meaning to the phrase, no room at the inn. Most of the carols sung here don't come from the usual repertoire. Some of them are very local. Some are sort of from the wider area, maybe 20, 30 miles radius, and then some have travelled from almost anywhere, um, from the south coast of England, from Canterbury, places like that. What you've got is sets of words that are a lot older than the tunes. We know that some of the tunes go back to 1750, 1760, but we've got words that go back before that. And what you've got is people choosing a tune that they love and then the words being sung to them that they like. And in another village, you'll maybe find the same tune and, and different words. And shall be a the most famous Christmas carols that absolutely everybody knows don't seem to be part of this tradition. Is that, has that always been the case? Occasionally, you'll hear Silent Night or Oh Come All Ye Faithful. Well, take the case of Oh Little Town of Bethlehem or Once in Royal David's City. You're talking about carols that are considerably newer. And these were the very carols that were introduced into the church to replace these older carols, these more robustious carols. And that's why the Victorian reformers frowned. They frowned on these carols because they considered it a bit decadent to be having fun and enjoying yourself. Choir came forth from his rich old hall, and the peasants by two and by three. The waterman let his hatchet fall, and the shepherd left his tree. I first came here, a uh, callow youth. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that these songs aren't really sung in many other places? Yorkshire tenacity. <laughs> it's, it's, they were like, all over the country. tradition. It's always been yeah, sung. The yeah. years ago. Yeah, they, uh, bas basically, they refused to bow to the church, who said, yeah. you know, you can't do these uh, these songs anymore. We've got a nice nice hymnal for you to sing from. And they said, well, you can sing them if you want to. And if you won't let us sing them in the church, we'll go and sing them in the pub. It's a willingness to come together and be together and enjoy community spirit, which is dying in so many places. We still have it here. It used to be religion that united the community, but it isn't anymore. But here, it's this. Will it go on? 
yeah. and there's the next yeah. generation. Yeah. Yeah. They still do it in the schools. They sing these. They sing these songs in the schools. I'm trying to put my finger on what exactly is going on here. Clearly, it's not a religious service, but nor is it a straightforward pub sing-along either. There's undoubtedly something about carols that has allowed them to survive across the centuries so well in so many different forms. There's a joy and accessibility to carols that sets them apart from all other forms of sacred music. For some, Christmas carols remind them of the innocence and preciousness of childhood. For others, it's the one time of the year they identify with a profound moral truth, that Christianity, like most religions, is about helping those who are more vulnerable than ourselves. And carols have a strong sense of this truth in them, with exotic kings paying tribute to a small baby in a cattle shed. Long may the Christmas carol continue to move, provoke, and inspire with its glad tidings of comfort and joy. <laughs>